good Sunday evening. We're going to start off the, uh, this evening with uh, Hallelujah, I'm Going Home, page 178. <laughs> Joy bells are ringing in my happy soul today. For I have started in that good old gospel way. Jesus has come to my heart and there to stay. Hallelujah, I'm going home. Well, glory, hallelujah. Well, soon I'm going home. Going home, therefore to Rome. I am not Thank you, Brother Jason, musicians. Hallelujah. I'm going home. Well, we want to greet you on this Sunday evening. Trust you've had a wonderful day thus far. I know now uh, we've got this threatening weather that's supposed to continue on through the evening and into the night, but you just be careful. The Lord's going to take care of us. We thank God for the way he blessed, took care of us last Sunday. Uh, evening, the storms came through, and we had Brother James Heidelberg, his family, Severin Cobb, had extensive damage, but they're all well, and we're thankful for that. But we are glad to be able to come into your home or wherever you are this evening with this service, and we want you to be blessed. I'm glad Brother Jason chose I'd like to dedicate that song to the memory of Brother Johnny Autry great man of God that we've known and preached with, worked with for years, that went home to be with the Lord this morning, the early part of this day. We're asking you to pray for Sister Autry and her family, and uh, many of you don't know, I did not know Brother Johnny, but many of you that listen will know, and uh, our hearts are saddened uh, that we'll miss him here, but thank God he's gone home to be with the Lord Great, great man of God, preached this gospel for many years, pastored that great church, Philadelphia Deliverance Tabernacle, Jasper, or Lynn, Alabama, actually, for better than 40 years. So God bless this Autry and her family. We trust that you all are well, and uh, I trust that you, and I know that you enjoyed the morning service with Brother Andy, and then, of course, the children's church in the afternoon. I hope that you all. Uh, young and old alike got to see that. Some of you say, well, that's children's church. Some of you adults, you ought to watch that and kind of let you know what's going on. I trust you did. Uh, if you didn't, you still can. It's still there archived. I want to say this evening that we appreciate Brother Andy uh, and these fellows that come with us out here uh, for these services. Uh, Brother Tim course comes and does music brother jason of course you've seen already and uh brother cody and brother joey and then of course there's brother ethan up there on the camera he is our technical guru he knows what to do i don't but he's doing a great job and when you see these guys later on when we're able to fellowship together brother andy brother tim brother cody brother joey brother jason brother ethan you be sure and tell them how much you appreciate all that they have done. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer this evening. You know exactly what you need from the Lord. And uh, just tell him right there where you are, what you need. And we're going to pray for that need and believe that the Lord is going to minister and meet needs this evening. Our Father, we come to you this evening in the name of Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace and your goodness. Oh, God, how good you have been to us. 
Lord, through this very difficult and trying time. But, Lord, this time should not have caught us unaware because you warned us in the early part of this year that this was going to be a difficult time for our Christian community, and certainly it has. But, Lord, we're also believing, as you have promised us, it's going to be a great time when this is all done, it's all over. But, Lord, I'm asking you this evening that you would minister in the hearts and the lives of your people, our congregation, our men, our women, our boys and girls, those that are not well, those that are sick, those who are in the hospital, whatever the, the need may be. Lord, I'm asking you, some of, our, some of our congregation have friends and relatives that are sick. We're asking you to heal them all. But God, more than to heal the body, we're asking you, Lord, that through this service and the, and the morning service and every service that souls will be born into the kingdom of God. We pray that, Lord, and then when this is over, I pray, God, that there will be a great harvest, that we'll be able to welcome many, many souls into our churches to see them saved, become a part of our family, to baptize them. Oh, God, I pray for this harvest. I pray, God, that's the next step as we've gone through this difficult time that there will be a harvest brought into the kingdom of God. Continue to bless him this service this evening, every part of it. I pray that your spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost, will come into every home, that every person will be blessed and touched by your divine power and by your love. We thank you, O oh God, for your safekeeping from this virus, this weather that they say could even go into the evening, the night hours. We ask you to keep everyone safe from harm. Just bless, we do pray. Continue to bless through this service. Anoint the Word of God. Help us to do that that's pleasing to you. And we'll praise you in Christ's name. Amen. I want to thank you so much for your faithfulness with your tithe and offerings. I tell you often here from the pulpit when we're together in the sanctuary that you're the greatest. And now I'm telling you again, it's just been wonderful, amazing how that you have continued to support the work of the Lord with your tithe and offerings, and we appreciate that so very, very much. I'm sure that you'll see on the screen the address, Post Office Box 65, Ellisville, Mississippi, 39437. As you continue to do that, we are praying, trusting that it won't be that long now till we'll be able to be back together in the house of the Lord. Remember tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock, uh, our, our online camp meeting. Uh, we will be uh, ministering uh, a, a DVD, a sermon from the past. I think this week we're with one of the Fire on the Mountain services. And so tune, tune in for that tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock Wednesday. 7 o'clock is our Sunday school Bible study time. Brother Andy did a tremendous job this past week. Brother Jason will be doing it this coming Wednesday. And we're so thankful that you are with us and sharing the Sunday school lesson with us. We're going to go now. Brother Tim is going to bring us a good song. And then when he is finished with that song, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, and we're going to read a text there, and then we're going to begin to preach and, and say that that the Lord has laid on my heart for this service this evening. Bless us with a song, Brother Tim. Well, I was tested by the tempter. I was tested by the throne. I was burdened with my sorrow.
Yes, amen. Thank you, Brother Tim. Tell him when you see him, you get there before I do, just tell him I'm coming because I've got my ticket. I've been to Calvary. I'm born again, and I'm ready to go home. Before we read and pray, we're going to pray again, then we're going to get into the Word of God. I want to thank the Lord for some of the good reports that we're hearing of some of you and your walk with the Lord, and some of you seem to be getting closer to God through this and your prayer life, and I think that's what it's all about. But I want us to get right into the Word of God. I, I know it's sometimes a little difficult to just sit there and concentrate because, you know, you're getting texts, the phone's ringing, or whatever's happening, the soup's about to boil over, and you got to go check the stove or whatever. But I want you to do your best to hear the Word of the Lord this evening that God has dealt with my heart. I told my wife this morning, I said, I just need a congregation in an hour. That's all. But we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Then we're going to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, and we'll read one verse there. Dear Father in heaven, again, we are standing here this evening with grateful hearts and minds, thanking you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. As bad as this situation has been, we can imagine how it could have been so much worse. But because of your mercy and your grace, you have kept us, you have helped us. But now, Lord, we're going into the Word of God, and I want you to minister to every heart and life that looks, watches this message and this service. May this Word of God pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and join and mar. May our hearts be enriched. May we be encouraged and challenged and strengthened. And we will give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In the Revelation chapter 3, I want to read one verse, verse 20. We will be uh, looking at some other verses as we go along in, in this message this morning. We'll be looking at some other things. But this verse in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, you know it well. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, open the door. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I want to preach to you this evening for a few minutes. I want to use for the title of this message, The Clarion Call of God, the clarion call of God. Now, most of you, perhaps, you know, when I use that word or those words, the clarion call, you would understand. But maybe we'll take just a moment here to tell you exactly what we're talking about, the clarion call. A clarion, this word clarion, comes from the name of an ancient instrument, an ancient instrument that was used by the Greeks, and I'm sure probably other civilizations. When there was the need for extreme attention, when there was the need that people would stop, lay aside everything that they were doing because a message is about to go forth, this instrument, which was something akin to a trumpet or a bugle, but it gave a very, we're told, it gave a very loud, a very high-pitched, high-toned, shrill sound. I guess, you know, we could kind of compare that instrument to the, the, the sirens of our day and our emergency vehicles. When you hear that sound, you know it's time to pay attention. Uh, uh, the weather alarms, whatever it is. So the clarion call was that sound would go forth. Everything would stop. Everything would cease. People would stop right where they were in their tracks, waiting for the king, the emperor, or whoever the governor it was to say whatever it was that needed to be said, that needed to be heard. It was a loud call. It was a clear call. And so today, a, a call, it strongly expressed a demand or request for action. 
So I believe this evening that we have heard the clarion call of God. I believe, I believe that through this situation that we have been through, that we have seen things come to a halt. Things come basically or largely to a standstill because God had something very, very special to say that God had something that he needed to talk to his people about. So I do believe that we have heard that what we have gone through has been a clarion call. It's been designed, and, and even though I believe every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, but I do believe that God allows things to happen to wake us and to get our attention. So why have we not been able to come to church? Why have we not been able to congregate and get together? Why has our lifestyle been so changed? Ladies and gentlemen, there can be no other answer than the fact that God had something special to say to his people and something special to say to the world. And it could not be said, it could be said, but the voice of God could not be heard in all the chatter, in all the business, in all the running hither and thither, in all of our activity. God has spoken. I believe when we were going full steam ahead that God spoke. I believe as sports stadiums were filled with tens of thousands of people, God spoke. I believe as businesses were humming and machines were turning out work, that God spoke. But I believe the cheering of the crowd in the great stadiums of the world drowned out the voice of God. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that the noise of the machinery running at, at full speed to turn out the products that we need were drowning out the voice of Almighty God. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that our own family activities down by the lake, down at the beach, or wherever we were, there was so much noise that we could not hear God talk. I believe God's been talking. I believe God's been talking all the time. But I believe that we have been too busy. And our world has been so noisy that we have not been able to hear the word of God. And then all of a sudden, there came a clarion call. All of a sudden, there was a news flash. All of a sudden, there was a reporter that told us the grave danger that we were in. So we went inside our homes. We shut the doors. There were no stadiums open with tens of thousands of people. There were no ball games, no sports activities coming into our homes where we were so involved with, with our idolatrous worship of sports and other things. Oh, no, some of you have not been able to go to work. Some of you have not been able to hear the sound of that machinery. So what's happening now in this moment of quiet calmness? Let us hear what our God is saying to us today. We must not allow this precious time. We must not allow this precious quiet time to pass us by. We must not allow our fears and our worries and our dread to take the place of the noise and the clamor that we still are not hearing the voice of God. I confess to you that my lifestyle has been greatly altered. I've not been able to walk the halls of a hospital, and that burdens me. I've not been able to walk the halls of a nursing home to visit with our precious people there. And by the way, our precious brother Hall in the nursing home celebrated his 99th birthday this past week. God bless Brother Hall. 
But brother and sister, our lifestyle has been altered. I've done things, as many as you have, that I should have done a long time ago. But I didn't have time because I was too busy. But I want to confess to you that this time has not been lost. Because during this time that I've not been able to travel. In fact, today I was supposed and scheduled to be in Fort Smith, Arkansas to start a camp meeting tonight, a, a sectional camp meeting, but of course I'm not there. But this time has not been in vain because, my friend, God has talked to my heart. God has spoken to my spirit. I have heard the voice of God in ways that I feel certain I would not have heard had it not been for the situation. I trust it's the same with you. I trust it is. You say, oh, no, preacher. God has talked to me. You're wrong. You're dead wrong. If you can sit there and watch this live stream and say God has not talked to you, I declare unto you that God has talked. Maybe you haven't listened. Maybe you haven't heard. But it's not because God is not talking. But listen, we're not through yet. Our governor has declared here in the state of Mississippi that we have at least another week. And then gradually, we're going to have the noise coming back. Gradually the activities are going to come. Gradually our minds will be caught up again. Could I encourage you to take this next week and listen? No, I don't have to ask God to speak because he's speaking. I have to ask you to listen to the call of God. If we allow this time, to pass, and we have not heard from God, then the purpose of it all will be lost on us. But it's not going to be lost on everybody because somebody is hearing that call. There are many of these calls throughout the Word of God. I read the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah heard, Isaiah my dear friend, Isaiah went into the temple to pray in the year that King Uzziah died. Isaiah's world stopped. Uzziah died. Uzziah, the great king, a relative of Isaiah. That's where his trust was. But then the news came that Isaiah had died. Uh, Uzziah had died. The word came to Isaiah. Isaiah's world stopped. He felt like everything caved in on him because the king in whom he had the greatest confidence of all, that great king Uzziah had died. But what happened to Isaiah? What happened to Isaiah when his world crashed? What happened to Isaiah when his walls came tumbling down? I'll tell you what happened to Isaiah. The Bible tells us that in the year that King Uzziah died, that Isaiah went into that temple. He went into that temple there and began to talk to God. This is, of course, in chapter 6. We'll go back to chapter 1. But Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Six months from now, this is what I want somebody to say. In the year, in the year that COVID-19 came, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. He saw the glory of God. He saw the glory of God. And then he heard the voice of God. Busy with King Uzziah. Busy, no doubt, in the court of King Uzziah. He had not been able to hear this, but his world stopped. His world caved in, and this is what he heard. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? 
He didn't hear that until his world came to a halt and he heard the voice of God. Who shall I send and who will go for us? You believe that's the first time God had ever said that to Isaiah? Maybe so. But I've got my doubts. I believe that God had been trying to talk to Isaiah for a long time. But it was only when his world was turned upside down. And in the quietness of the moment, he heard God said, Is there anybody that will go for me? Is there anybody that could sin? And Isaiah's answer was this, Hear him I, send me. So in chapter 1, in verse 18, these are the words that we need there. Come now and let us reason together. Can we not come and reason together this morning that we've been needing a word from God for a long, long time? Let's see if we can have it today. As we look through the Word of God, there's so much we could say. We could back up from the book of Isaiah to the Song of Solomon, the clarion call of the, of the king to the Shunammite. The Song of Solomon is a great love story. It's a story where the king fell in love with a peasant girl. The king that rode around in his chariot with his beautiful horses fell in love with a little farmer's daughter that no doubt when the first time that the king saw that Shunammite, she very likely could have been barefoot working in the vineyards, working in the fields. But a king fell in love with a farmer's daughter, with a peasant. A beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords that fell in love with Kenny Morris, that fell in love with you, just a nobody, but he fell in love with us all as individuals. Then the king begins to pursue that farmer's daughter, that little Shunammite, that peasant girl that was working in the field. In chapter 10, or chapter 2 rather, and verse 10, this is what the little Shunammite peasant girl had to say. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away, for the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of the birds has come. The voice of the turtle, the turtle dove, is heard in the land. The fig tree put it forth her green figs. The vines with a tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one and come away. I want to read that to you this morning to let you know that the birds are going to sing again, to let you know that the turtle dove is going to coo again, to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, that there will be figs on the fig tree and the vines are going to have grapes because God is still God and he's still on the throne. But now what is he doing? He's calling us to come to him. Listen, listen carefully. Verse 16 and 17, she admits something. She said, my beloved is mine and I am his. But then all, oh, all oh, verse 17. Verse 17 is so sad. Her reply to that beautiful invitation to come was this. Until the daybreak, and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved. Be like a young roe. Be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Betha. You know what that word means? That word means separation. 
I heard your voice. I heard you call me in your life. I heard when you called to me and said to me that I was your fair one. I was your love. I heard you call me your dove. I've heard you call me. You're undefiled, but I'm not ready yet. I'm not quite ready. I want to have this time. Separation, oh my. May that not be our attitude. We look a little further in the chapter 5 of the Song of Solomon. She said, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved. He's come back. He's come back. And in the still and the stillness of the night, in the still, in the stillness of the night, in the darkest hour, she said, I hear something. I hear something. Everything is still. There's no sound. There's no noise. There's no clamor. I hear something. And as she listened carefully, she said, it is the voice of my beloved talking to me. What is he saying? He's saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. What was her reply? What was her reply? The stillness had gotten her so comfortable. The stillness had so relaxed her. The stillness had so caused her to be so relaxed, so calm, so sedentary. And this is what she said. I've put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I've washed my feet. How shall I define this stillness that we're going through, this quietness, this calmness? May it not have the effect on anybody that says I've got so relaxed by staying at home on Sunday morning and Sunday evening and watching service over the internet that I think I'll just stay here. I'm so comfortable. Ladies and gentlemen, if that becomes your attitude, you have missed the whole purpose of what's happening in this world. She got up later. She did open the door, but it was too late then. Maybe let's not let that be it. That's the negative side of what we're talking about. The mountains of Bether. I'm too comfortable. Not now. Let's go back to the New Testament for a moment. Let's talk about a man in the New Testament that got a clarion call from God. A man walking along a dusty road, perhaps even riding a donkey. When all of a sudden the trumpet sounded, the clarion call, the instrument blared, so loud that it stopped him in his tracks. We talk of Saul of Tarsus, of course. His clarion call was a light that was brighter than the noonday sun. He was on his way to Damascus to put Christians in prison. He was on his way to Damascus, no doubt, to condemn those that believed in Christ to death. He was consenting and taking part in the death of the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then his world stopped. His world stopped somewhere between Jerusalem and Damascus. Everything stopped. Everything was silent. And everything was still. There was a call. There was a call. The man who was walking is now lying on the ground, or at least kneeling. The man that was on a journey has been stopped in his journey between where he was 
and where he was going. We know that feeling, don't we? Some of you had a vacation planned, but you weren't able to go. Some of you had a ticket bought with the airlines, but God stopped that, didn't he, or allowed it to be stopped, and you weren't able to go. I was going to Arkansas. A couple of weeks ago, I was supposed to be in Tennessee. My plans were changed. I'd been home, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Why did God knock Saul of Tarsus down? Because God wanted the stillness and the quietness where Saul could hear his voice. I don't want you to think that I'm pretending to be anything that I'm not. Some kind of super spiritual. But I believe I've heard things from God that perhaps I wouldn't have heard if I'd have went to Tennessee two weeks ago. Or to Arkansas this week. Ladies and gentlemen, was that the first time God ever dealt with Saul? Don't you think that when Stephen was dying, God spoke? Don't you think when the crowd was throwing those stones on Stephen, they were hoorahing and cheering every time a blow would land from one of those stones a, a, a solid blow on Stephen's body. No doubt there was a cheer. No doubt there was applause. No doubt there was a rancorous and a raucous crowd that day. And God could have said anything he wanted to say. But Saul wouldn't have heard it. It would have fallen on deaf ears. But now... He's either kneeling or lying in the middle of a dusty road. His ticket's been canceled. His trip's been put on hold. It's quiet. It's still. And God says to this man, as he went to Damascus, saw, saw. He heard God call his name. I want to talk to somebody right now and tell you that God's been calling your name. There's an unsaved man out there that when you were on that plane, God was calling your name. You were at that factory. God was calling your name. There's an unsaved lady out there. When you were going about all of your business, God was calling your name. For there was too much noise. There was too much clamor. But now, now there is no factory machinery in your, and no flight. Now, it's still and it's quiet. Listen. Listen carefully. God's calling your name. Preacher, I don't hear God calling your name or my name. No. But what about that tear that just eased out of the corner of your eye? What about that tear that right now is gently beginning to roll down your cheek. Is that not the voice of God calling your name? Right there in the stillness of your living room. You're not in this sanctuary. You're not disturbed by the crying of a baby or someone getting up from the pew in front of you and walking out to the restroom. You're not disturbed by some mother looking through the baby's hair for whatever reason or someone playing on their phone 
in the congregation, in the stillness of that room, God's calling you right now. There's somebody out there that's got a call on your life. You know what the will of God is, but you've been too busy to do it. But he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I'm going to hurry. I'm going a little long here, but we're about done. Not too long, I don't suppose. Not to me anyway. And, and, and as Saul heard his name, he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for you to kick against the bricks. Some of you don't understand the tension that's been in your life. Some of us don't understand the stress that's been in our life. I'll tell you what it was. You thought it was this, that, or the other. But Paul was kicking against the pricks. What were the pricks? The pricks were that God had been talking to him, but he was too busy to hear. Why the stress? Why the anxiety? Why the troubled spirit over the last years? I'll tell you why. Because God's been trying to talk, but we've been too busy to hear. That's the reason your life has been pricked. I must hurry. Then Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will thou help me to do? Would you say it, friend? Right there where you are right now, would you just close your eyes, raise your hand to God, and say, Lord, what is it do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? You know the story, you can read the rest of it for yourself. God said, go to Damascus. He went to Damascus. God said, go to a street called Straight. And he went to a street that was called Straight. And God told him, ladies and gentlemen, to go to the house of a man named Judas. And he went to the house of a man named Judas. And God sent a man by the name of Ananias. Ladies and gentlemen, what, what, what would have happened not only to Saul but to the church world if Saul had not been stopped and had a quiet time for God to talk to him? Do you realize that if we count Paul as the author of the book of Hebrews, which I believe that he is, that Paul authored, we will just say it like this, in case he didn't, somewhere between 13 and 15 of the 26 books of your Bible. So what was the result of the knockdown time? What was the result of the quiet time? What was the result of the days when Paul was, Saul was blind and could not see? I'll tell you what it was. We have, ladies and gentlemen, at least half of the books of the Bible and most of the New Testament and the church went around the world. Listen to me. You stop. Your world is still for a purpose. There are no sporting events for a purpose. There are no societal events for a purpose. God is trying to talk to you. And he's talking to me. What wilt thou have me to do, Lord? Adam got a clarion call from God. Where art thou, Adam? Moses got a clarion call from God when he saw fire in the bush. Tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Esther got a clarion call from God when her cousin Mordecai said, I think this is the reason you're here at this time, is to save your people. The disciples got a clarion call from God. 
go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. Brother Tim is beginning to play. And as Tim begins to play softly on the piano, I want you to listen carefully. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, the revelator said in chapter 18, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, come the habitation of devil and the hold of every foul spirit, cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornications with her. The merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven. Listen, we could preach here. All nations, practically the world, is touched by this virus. But John said, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Babylon's fall. Everything stopped. And he said, I heard a voice coming from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. And be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Sir, don't try to stop that tear. Let it flow, and let another one follow. Ma'am, your heart's not in a field. That's not the reason it's racing in your bosom. It's God talking to you. Now let's talk to God. My friend, He's calling you to salvation. It's a call of love. He's calling us to service. We're not going to allow this slowdown time to relax us. But like Saul of Tarsus, we're going to walk in obedience. We're going to make a difference in our church. We're going to make a difference in our world. We're going to make a difference in our family. We're going to make a difference in our walk with God. Father, You've been talking for a long, long time. We've just been so surrounded by noise, clutter. We've not been able to hear. But we've received a call, a clarion call, a call that has gotten our attention. And you're talking to us. God, I hear you. I hear you talking. You're calling somebody's name. May that man, that woman that's unsaved right now where they are, heed that call and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. May that man, that woman with a call of service on their life, but they've been too busy to hear. Now hear the call, my God. May that Sunday school teacher that's been so so slack in, in preparation, may these weeks, if they're not able to teach, they hear a call to renew dedicate of that preacher. Oh God. May our church hear the voice that's speaking. These empty pews are a clarion call to me, God. There are no disturbances here this morning. You're talking. We're going to go off there now. Just a moment. But I'm asking you don't get up out of that chair just yet. Don't walk out of the presence of God right now. But just sit there. 
Just sit there for a few minutes with your eyes closed. That's right. Some of you had already gotten up. Just sit back down. Close your eyes and say, talk to me, Lord. Be still, be quiet, and hear that still, small voice. God bless you as I pray.